Good morning. Today, I awoke with the energy of new earth in my heart and on my mind. Without question, over the past eight weeks, we have undoubtedly experienced what continues to be an extraordinary journey through uncertainty. We have all experienced loss in some form during this time, whether it be the loss of the physical life of loved ones, a loss experience tied to constraints we feel with regard to how our daily life has changed, or any other sense of loss that we might feel at this time. All are relevant. And this is certainly a time to acknowledge the severity of life's impermanence and the value of priorities. May they be permanently rearranging according to what we now find truly matters. In times of crisis, we learn much about ourselves and how we see ourselves responding. We can assuredly assess our efforts in preparing, both individually and as a collective. Many of us have likely learned that a time of crisis may not actually be the ideal point to start a meditation practice. But regardless of how prepared we were, we're here. And though the recent experiences of pandemic could surely be described as a crucifixion time for our world, A Course in Miracles reminds us we are meant to acknowledge the crucifixion, yet dwell on the resurrection. So we do. We acknowledge with open, awake, and heavy hearts the pain, fear, struggle, and discomfort we all experience. And as we apply the teachings of master teachers, we know these circumstances have come bearing the possibility for purpose to be identified. And as the result of new realization, new life to be manifested through each of us. So today's talk is actually the first part of a five session series titled Contributing Greatly to a World in Need of Great Contributors. Its intention is to look closely at five phases I like to call the five phases of soul, which help me to have a framework for the process I have experienced within myself continuously from the time my personal journey into conscious living began over 25 years ago. Interestingly enough, I did receive what many would agree to be a quite blunt and direct invitation from the universe to wake on up. <laughs> and what I've learned since then is that life has this very benevolent way about letting us know this is going to be on the test. And the one after that, and the one after that. And so for me, the words I'm speaking about may have been shared by my sister, who at the time was also earthly young, but the wisdom her words contain is timeless. She said to me, their reality has nothing to do with you. It's you and only you who can decide what is true for you and for your life. And it would be several years before I would begin to relate that many sacred truths are contained in those sentences. but. I realized that those words were my earliest memory of having a dog in the race, consciously speaking. And so many years later, I realize, thankfully, there is no race. But yet this exquisite opportunity to invest in my own growth that's aligned with my own chosen beliefs, which brings me to the realization that all of life is invested in my getting it, in our getting it. Getting that we are beings of energy living in form and that our power to co-create the experiences we have individually and collectively is unlimited. Our contributions do matter. And whether or not we actually contribute is not the option. The option is whether or not we contribute well, greatly, as in of service in a way that serves the betterment of life as we know it and the ultimate survival of our species. So good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you all into my home once again. And I look forward to spending some time today talking about the power of great contribution and the five phases of soul beginning with opening. But before we start there, Someone sent me a clip that I would love to share with you all this morning first that's relevant to the times in which we find ourselves. I apologize for the production quality, but in these days and times, 
we do what we can with what we have where we are. Tell me the one about the rice bed that I go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favorite. I promise just once more. Okay, snuggle down, my boy, though I know you know full well. The story starts before then, in a world I once would dwell. It was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's twenty-twenty. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we ever could have planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick, you could have anything you dreamed of in a day, and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke, but the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew square and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but amidst the noise, they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them while down below, we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We'd forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac, shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic, because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out, already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why. It's best to not upset the lorries. More convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. While we all were hidden amidst the fear, and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their mums. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And with the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe. And the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing. Some were singing. Some were baking. We'd grown so used to bad news, but some good news was in the making. And so when we found the cure, and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found the one we'd left behind. Old habits became extinct and they made way for the new and every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the Great Realization. And yes, since then there have been many. But that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's 2020. But if you look at the camera, they know someone's filming it exactly. because they can see you. Exactly. If you look at the camera, they know someone's filming it. Okay, back, lie back down. Wait, can I just practice right now? Yes. <laughs> Can I just practice right now? <laughs> so thank you to my good friend in Florida, Michael White, who sent me that video clip yesterday right in the nick of perfect time for me to share it with you all today. Uh, I invite you at this point to just make yourself comfortable in the space you find yourself. you to close your eyes if you feel so inclined. Allow your breath to happen easily. Allow the structure on which you sit or lay to support you completely. Hmm. 
together we consider the great realization 2020 the realization that now more than ever our contributions to this life to our world to ourselves are more important than ever And in realizing that life is simply a shedding and a growing, a shedding and a growing. In this moment, in the interest of our contributions, what part of ourselves is no longer essential. What do we bring into this now moment today that has come to be identified and recognized and loved and appreciated and released in the interest of our best contributions being made from this point forward? because we recognize that contribution is ever evolving just as we as individual expressions of all that is. Our contributions now may be very different. They may feel very different than the contributions that were important to us to make earlier in life. And in this now moment, in affirming alignment with the God of our understanding, with love, with peace, with all prosperity, we open to the truth and the realization that our contributions are our legacy. Our legacy that begins now. And in considering that legacy, what will yours be? How will it feel to those around you? How will it feel? inside yourself as it unfolds. In the silence, we consider our legacy. No longer clinging to the non-essential. Bringing into focus now that which serves our highest and our highest expressions of life. We affirm that our contributions heal, bless, and serve the evolution of ourselves, of our world, of all that is, and knowing this together we allow it to be so, and so it is. Hmm.
And so as we return to this space <clears throat> for a time of considering exactly how we come to be the great contributors that our world sincerely needs, always and especially at this time. We consider how important it is that each of us do and be what and who we're here to do and be, because only we can do what we can do uniquely, as unique as our fingerprint, as unique as our heartbeat, are our great contributions. And something that I would like to say quickly about contribution is, many times we consider contribution as achievements, or maybe the, the profession that we go into, and how we, through that, touch the lives of other people, and maybe what we teach, or, or what, we, what we learn. For everyone it's different, but for the purposes of this conversation, I invite you to contribute, excuse me, I invite you to consider that contribution happens now, just like all life, in the present. We're making a contribution anytime we are anywhere, simply by showing up and offering the energy that we are in any space. And so, a big part of this conversation is considering what we as individuals sort of experience as the ongoing cycle within ourselves that determines how we are in the world. Because how we are determines how we show up and how those around us are invited to experience us and as a result experience life. So for me, I thought about what are the phases that I've noticed myself going through repeatedly over the years. And in this conversation, uh, I've referred to them as the five phases of soul. And I see that in the course of my life, I go through periods or seasons of, of opening, of being available, of being sort of in inquiry, of What's next? What are you trying to teach me? What is mine to be aware of in this now moment? And then I realize when it becomes clear to me, I move into a place of constructing or building that the constructs that are inspired by that new realization that I may have received in the opening period. And once I have sort of a construct of the new idea or belief, I feel like there's an emergence. An emergence into a new experience of life. And when I feel that I've emerged and I'm working with this new concept, whatever it might be, I move naturally into a place of inhabiting that space that is the result of the new realization. It's very important, I think I heard Marianne Williamson speak several years ago about how important it is to inhabit a space that we come to, to fully inhabit that space in order so that we can learn what is ours to learn in that space and then naturally transcend that space so that we can continue consciously our own growth and development to the next phase, of course, which would be opening again to what is now for me to do next? What is the next right thing for me to do? And so this phase I've noticed in my own life, of course, is cyclical, opening, constructing, emerging, inhabiting, transcending, opening, and so forth. So today I wanna to focus on phase one of this process, the opening phase. And why is it so important that we be open with regard to contribution. Well, number one, we're what we have. When you think about it in regards to what we see in the world and the opportunities that are there for us to meet, where is God in the midst of tragedy 
but living in the hearts and hands of humanity. Uh, Singer-songwriter Claudia Carawan wrote that in, in her song titled Shine. And it's so true. We are what we have to work with. And so what we find over the course of life is this continual cycle of challenge and our creativity rising to meet that challenge. And our cre creativity uh, rising to meet the challenge is actually our contribution happening moment by moment. Contribution is life and life is always now. So being open to the possibility that life has very important and specific things for us to contribute is a part of the process. If we're not open for one reason or the other, if we're not available for life to reach us, then it's, very, it's going to be very much more difficult for us to actually make our contributions in, in the fullest and highest, most present form. So why open in the first place? Well, to look at how to open and what opening actually is, maybe we flip it around a little bit and first consider why we close. And what does that mean? Closing versus opening. You can probably relate to that experience of being somewhere and something happens and maybe a song, a familiar song that you know, that may remind you of a painful time in your life happens or somebody says something that reminds you of something difficult you went through and you can feel your whole energy sort of contract. You can feel that self-preservation mode kind of kick in and, and sort of a shield comes down uh, and we go into that protective mode to keep ourselves from feeling um, because of course our ego believes that we could potentially be harmed if we are able to feel. So that in essence would be the opposite of opening, right? It would be closing. And why we close is a very interesting uh, conversation um, that I have read in the past in my opinion, very well articulated in The Untethered Soul by uh, Michael Singer, The Journey Beyond Yourself. And for those of you who have read The Untethered Soul, um, I'm sure you agree that it is quite the powerful journey uh, of self-realization. Um, and chapter seven is no joke. It is, <laughs> it is definitely um, uh, full of wisdom in and of itself, uh, right in the title, Transcending the Tendency to Close. Um, and it speaks about basically why we have this uh, tendency, as it's written, to close in the first place. Um, I love how Singer uh, reflects that our greatest impetus as a species has always been the survival instinct uh, and doing whatever we had to do just to stay alive. But once we sort of take care of all that is in line with our physical survival, then what naturally occurs is the evolution to protecting the psyche or the ego, if you will, or the psychological self. And we begin many times very early in life to learn there are certain spaces within ourselves that need to be protected because we've received memories or excuse me we've received messaging from the world around us that in somehow we are inadequate that we're not enough that we um, obviously have things we can all work on but the messaging that comes to us from uh, those around us as the result of their own fear can be very damaging and, and disenabling. And so in this um, book, Singer talks about how it's common when someone or something stimulates one of our fears or insecurities, we instantly withdraw, we close down, we pull back. And we, as I mentioned before, we sort of bring this psychic shield around ourselves when we feel threatened. But the unfortunate thing is that when we do that, what we, also, what we also simultaneously do is we close down our energy centers, beginning with our heart space. And if we're closed, then we're not available to 
life in the now moment. If we're closed as the result of attempting to protect ourselves from someone else's behavior or someone else's input, we're not available in the present for life to download into us the blueprint, so to speak, that is our path to greatest contribution. And so throughout the course of this chapter, Singer talks about, we learn there is, cons if we consistently protect ourselves, then we can never be free. We will constantly be at the helm of being closed. And this means inherently that our conscious experience of growth and the conscious experience of the soul phases that I mentioned earlier are unable to play the essential role that each of us needs it to in making the contributions that only we can make. In order to be open and available to life, we must learn to experience conflict well. And we think about experiencing conflict well, and I immediately uh, go to an experience that I've had in personally coaching um, a couple who anytime they experience conflict in their relationship, both of them are so, find it so difficult to see themselves and see their, um, the possibly the ways that they've contributed negatively to the dynamic that they're unable to get any further with one another because they both close. And being invited to experience how each of them may have contributed negatively or harmfully to the dynamic, they pull back, they stop, they shut down. And so neither one of them are available for the resolution, the solution, the opportunity, because both are closed at the what can be considered the grippling fear of realizing that we're not perfect. So Singer speaks about in this chapter how it's essential to be able to see ourselves and see ourselves fully such that we can disarm the places within us that we might feel like we need to protect. But when we are able to see them for what they are, know the truth that they are not us, but they are the way that consciousness as us perceives, not us, but way that consciousness as us perceives, then we're able to apply unconditional love and possibly relax a bit more into the realization that there is nothing to protect. There is only life to be experienced. Singer writes, Real spiritual growth happens when there is only one of you inside. And this is the concept of living congruently. Real spiritual growth happens when there is only one of you inside. There's not a part that's scared and another part that's protecting the part that's scared. All parts are unified. Because there is no part of you that you're not willing to see, the mind is no longer divided into the conscious and the subconscious. Everything you see inside is just something you see inside. It's not you, it's what you see. There is simply this pure energy pouring inside of you that creates the ripples of thoughts and emotions, and there is the consciousness that's aware of it. There is simply you watching the dance of the psyche. And so then, when we consider why we might close, because we have this notion of it being important to defend our fears and insecurities, if we're able to see our fears and insecurities in a different way, then perhaps we're able to realize there is nothing to defend. He also gives great advice in this chapter about how do we stay open? How do we meet this urge in our lives to continually close and meet this urge with the ability to stay open? And he suggests that we begin by seeing the tendency to protect and defend ourselves, to be able to 
maintain our focus in the now moment in such a way that we can experience when we're being triggered. We feel that tightening perhaps, and we feel that energy swelling up inside of us that's asking us to, whoops. We feel that energy that's asking uh, us to direct our focus and our attention to the need to defend, right? And so when that comes up inside of us, we have the opportunity to simply not do that anymore. By, we just go about our business and put our whole being into whatever's happening instead of putting your whole being into your personal sensitivity. So we think about that in realizing that how being able to come present, to realize we're being triggered, to make a different choice in that space so that we don't close can allow us to be open for realizations, understandings, uh, inspirations about our contributions, how those things can actually combine in the present moment to strengthen our contribution in that moment at that time. Singer actually, uh, Singer also writes, what exactly does it mean to stop, to not follow that energy? It's something you do inside. It's called letting go. When you let go, you are falling behind the energy that is trying to pull you into it. And I love that concept. That has really helped me um, to consider what it might feel like in the midst of conflict, in the midst of feeling triggered, to actually fall behind that energy. Let it go. Fall behind, let it go. And that reminds me of uh, another Marianne Williamson quote, which is, would you prefer to have a miracle or a grievance? The two are mutually exclusive. In any given moment, would you prefer to experience a miracle or a grievance? And perhaps by falling behind that negative energy that we can sometimes feel to be overwhelming, then we can make miracles more welcome. In conclusion, I want to read a little bit from the end of this chapter, where he speaks about your center of consciousness is always stronger than the energy that is pulling on it. You just have to be willing to exercise your will. But it's not a fight or a struggle. It's not that you're trying to stop the energies from coming up inside. There is no wrong with feeling the energies of fear, jealousy, or attraction. It's not your fault that such energies exist. All the attractions, repulsions, thoughts, and feelings don't make any difference. They don't make you pure or impure. They are not you. You are the one who's watching, and that is pure consciousness. Don't think you'd be free if you just didn't have these kinds of feelings. It's not true. If you can be free, even though you're having these kinds of feelings, then you're really free, because there will always be something. So, I recommend the book, obviously, and especially the chapter seven with regards to um, remaining open, remaining available, um, and what may keep us from doing that. There's actually an exercise that I would like to invite you to consider um, doing at this time, which has a lot to do with contribution, and you may have noticed that I mentioned earlier about legacy. So take a few minutes, maybe not right now, but at some point today, and open to what your legacy might be. I love this quote, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. And so in knowing what you know now, in being who you are now, in considering what may be asking to fall away, in order to make space for what might be an improvement for your life and for your contributions, what might your legacy be? It doesn't necessarily have to be achievements, obviously. It can simply be 
what would you prefer that people remember about you when you walk out of a room that you've just been in? Your legacy can be anything that legacy means to you. And quick shout out to my friend Eric Cox, who um, is a local self-published author uh, who released his own book this year, Sign Up for Your Race and for Your Life. And this was one of the exercises in his book that I thought um, could serve us well in this conversation about contribution. Your legacy goes here and on this, um, in this space. So give some time to that as you consider uh, the importance of being open and available for your own blueprint and your download. And as we close today, I want to also share with you uh, an exercise uh, I've read, uh, I've mentioned before that I typically read from the Book of Awakening uh, with Mark Nepo on the daily. And um, there was a very interesting um, offering that he had on May the 2nd that perhaps you will find helpful, uh, as I have, in remaining present. Because one sure way, as we talked about, of coming into the present moment um, is live in your hands. And I'll tell you exactly what he means by that. I have a dear friend who has studied almost all there is to study about the heart and the mind and its dance of psychology. This study led her to a very old sage whose last instructions were, live in your hands. Once open to this, my dear friend, knowing nothing sure about stonework, found herself building a stone chapel in the side of a hill. In so doing, she consecrated the chapel that had been waiting in her heart. I have another friend who whenever she sees flowers, she must gently touch them. I've watched her countless times, finger yellow petals. She needs to touch the beauty, and when she does, I can see the beauty touch her. Then something in her opens a little further. To live in our hands humbles our mind into accepting something other than itself. It is how we heal each other and ourselves. We all come to live through a braille of the heart. So I invite you to live in your hands when you feel the invitation to close in life. When you're sitting at a stoplight and someone behind you lays on the horn as soon as it turns green, maybe you haven't gone quickly enough. Consider living in your hands, coming into the present moment feeling the steering wheel, noticing the color of the upholstery in the car instead of instantly closing in order to protect yourself from the judgment of that person behind you. Live in your hands. And let's take that into alignment for closing. God of our understanding, as we affirm and realize together the importance of our great contributions and of contributing greatly to a world now more than ever in need of great contributors. We affirm in this moment that opening is possible. Opening is available. And opening is essential being open, being available, such that the most important energy center of our being, our heart space, is available to the full experience of life. And knowing this, we affirm together our alignment and our unity with all that is knowing that everything that lives is contributing all the time, 
all of life breathes together in perfect collaborative harmony. All of life breathes together and we as individual expressions, unique and beautiful expressions of that life, we too breathe together. And affirming that we are well, knowing that we are safe, and feeling we are whole. We go forth into the coming week with intrigue, with availability, with sincerity and authenticity to do what is ours to do, to be who it is we are here to be. We support one another in this work. We are grateful for the opportunity to do this together. And we know together that all is well. And together, we affirm that so it is. I wish you a beautiful week ahead. And I would love to hear from you if you choose to write your legacy. I would love to hear what, you, what you've written. Share your thoughts with me anytime on Facebook, uh, Vic Sorrel, that's two R's and two L's, or Vic Sorrel at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you all, and I wish you a beautiful week ahead. Namaste.